Well, everybody, could I have your attention just for a few moments? And uh, I'm going to make some very brief remarks and talk a little bit about the ICCF. And uh, then uh, we'll start our full program about the, the, uh, the, the end of the main course. Um, thank you very much for coming. I know, obviously, it's a very busy day. A lot of stuff happening up on Capitol Hill. Uh, my name is John Gant. I'm president of the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. David Barron, the founder of the ICCF, is over there. And our executive director of the Conservation Council, Susan Lilas, uh, which a lot of uh, the NGO and corporate community is obviously knows very well, is, is over there. Um, anyway, we've got a, a great program on uh, freshwater security today. Um, our 2011 congressional briefing series um, has really focused on looking at conservation from a very people-oriented angle in the developing world and also showing why international conservation is important to U.S. interests, to U.S. jobs, U.S. security. Uh, our mission at the ICCF basically is to help promote, just in the way we have democratization and uh, uh, capitalism throughout the world, to actually also promote the fact that good natural resource management is in the United States' best interest. We believe that conservation is a fundamental component of sustainable development and is linked directly with poverty, poverty alleviation, um, conflict avoidance, regional security, global freshwater security, which we'll talk about today, global food security, uh, and also agricultural security. And these are obviously enormously important uh, components of any real development and, st and stability strategy that the U.S. Uh, obviously is promoting through its foreign policy over the years. Why conservation matters. Again, focusing on the human impact. We're obviously in love with wild places and wild animals. But we also understand that we have limited budgets. We also understand that the United States needs to make sure that every taxpayer dollar that's spent is spent in a way that is going to be um, uh, utilized for American interests and not just a stopgap philanthropy that will not teach people how to fish, but just gives them the fish. So here are some of the key components we've been focusing on this year. International conservation matters to the United States. This is something that really isn't talked a lot about or focused on a lot. We look at the fact that good natural resource management and conservation efforts levels the playing field for U.S. businesses and corporations. When you talk about illegal logging, when you talk about illegal fishing, you're talking a lot of times about companies and state industries that are run outside the United States that directly compete with our U.S. corporations. So we lose American jobs, we lose American competitiveness. And good conservation practice and management practice helps prevent that. We also talk about the security angle of America. The fact that we, as the world's global, only global superpower, we are extremely interested in achieving stability. In, in regions of the world that are often unstable. And a lot of these instabilities come about because of lack of good natural resource management, where eventually you have populations and individual nations warring over the last remaining vestiges of natural resources as they collapse. And this has been seen in Sudan. This has been seen in Rwanda. This can also be looked at when looking at Haiti and a lot of other countries around the world. Obviously, the supply chains are very important to, uh, for U.S. corporations, and they're important for American consumers. American corporations want to find good, sustainable products and supply chains that they know that they uh, will be able to deliver products to consumers at a very cheap and very um, uh, uh, sustained way. And so that's, conservation plays a big role in that. And obviously, um, at the end, I think we should thank and look at our American NGOs, like the World Wildlife Fund, as being some of the best goodwill ambassadors uh, to the United States in these countries and doing good work on the ground, and to our U.S. corporations. I mean, there's no better known symbol in the world, I think, than the Coca-Cola symbol. And that's something that people know and meet before they meet any other um, American. So it's important that Coke is also taking uh, fantastic responsibility and is doing a lot of great work uh, with uh, the World Wildlife Fund in these, in these efforts. Um, we have brought together the public and private and NGO sectors to really formulate good conservation policy. Our advisory council, World Wildlife Fund's obviously on there, so is Conservation International, the Nature Conservancy, Wildlife Conservation Society. These are the four uh, largest U.S.-based international conservation NGOs. Our other partners come from other NGOs 
uh, and some of the world's largest multinational corporations. A lot of them, some of the iconic symbols of America, like Coca-Cola, Starbucks, 3M, uh, National Geographic, J.P. Morgan. Um, so it's, these are really a lot of our goodwill ambassadors, if you will. Uh, the U.S. Congressional ICC, thank you, Representative Steve uh, Cohen, is here today. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. He is one of many. In fact, the Congre U.S. Congressional ICC is the second largest bipartisan caucus on Capitol Hill. Um, it's uh, roughly 50-50 in Democrats and Republicans. Uh, here is the co-chairman in the Senate and the House. We very much hope that if you are here and your member is not a member of the caucus, that you'll talk to us or these co-chairs' office and see about becoming a member of the caucus. Uh, the caucus um, does not take individual positions on issues uh, as a whole, but it does mean you're going to lend your congressman is going to lend their ear um, to the debate and to participate through staff, um, through the staff and uh, through other members in the debate itself. Um, Please come to our website. It's just been redone. We have been effectively trying to uh, really show these great conservation projects of our partners and really how they are um, helping support uh, the U.S. development agenda ab abroad, how they're helping with poverty alleviation, how they're helping with people's livelihoods, fresh water security, um, food security. So it's a it's pretty good at interactive uh, website. Uh, our briefing on water stewardship will, will, will uh, commence after the, the main course, and we are very happy to uh, be able to have two of our, um, our, our best known and uh, um, uh, hardest working partners in the areas of conservation uh, today to talk to you and give good successful examples and help motivate uh, more, uh, so more work's done in these uh, areas. So thank you very much, enjoy your meal, and we'll be back with you soon. I hope everybody has gotten something to eat. Um, we're going to start our uh, program. We've got three uh, speakers today. Um, and I'm going to introduce the first one, uh, Joe, from Coca-Cola. And then we'll have two subsequent speakers um, right afterwards. And, and then we'll do a question and answer, I think, for all three speakers once uh, all three of them have had a chance to uh, talk. And we'll take the microphone around if you have any uh, questions. So thank you very much, and I'll give the uh, uh, attention over to uh, Joe. All right. Thank you very much. No, I think, uh, yeah, I think, uh, do I need the microphone? Oh, I'll put it on. It's OK. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, OK. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Joe Raza, Coca-Cola. Uh, I'm the Global Water Resource Sustainability Manager, and I manage the Corporate Water Risk Management Program. We have a formal water resource sustainability program. And, um, and then I also lead the, the Community Water Partnerships and Replenish Program worldwide for Coca-Cola. And what I really want to do in just you know, a few minutes that we have is kind of tap across the top, kind of put some dimensions on the risk landscape, probably trends that you're well familiar with. And I'll try to give you a little bit of the industrial perspective on that. And um, we can hear about the conservation perspectives as well. Uh, and then I just want to briefly go over our water resource, our global water stewardship strategy to give you a little bit of a sense of how Coca-Cola is approaching the problem. And, um, and then really, I, li like, I usually like to say participation is more important than presentation. So hoping for a good discussion and some questions after we get through the content. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. I'm sorry. I'm going to blow these guys out. But. Okay. So. Um, uh, trends that you're really familiar with here, but uh, population growth, economic development, and uh, weather volatility uh, is probably a good term to describe uh, what's going on there. But um, there's some key points that I want to share with you about these. These are the mega trends that are shaping the water risk landscape over the next uh, really uh, few decades. And most of you are very familiar with the fact that 1.5 billion more people on the planet between 2010 and 2100, uh, uh, 2010 and 2020. Huge population growth, right? Uh, I want to, this is a topic we could spend a lot of time on, but I'm going to just try to put one key point in here. 10% of global water use is for hydration and hygiene. 70% is for agricultural production. 10% roughly is for energy. And then that 10% off to the left is for industrial commercial purposes that are not energy related. 
So 1.5 billion people with a hydration and hygiene need, 1 billion people today that don't have access to clean, safe, reliable water. So lots of pressure on that 10% box. After you've had a glass of water, you probably want a bowl of rice or something to eat so that there's going to be a huge amount of pressure on agricultural productivity and increase in water use in that 70% space, further pressuring the water supply. And economic development, that's key, right? I mean, there's, you're not going to go and find a government or a local government anywhere on the face of the earth that doesn't want local economic development. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, for energy, you're going to need energy for that. So, so if you're thinking about that and you're keeping up with the math, we're talking about 90% of global water use is allocated for hydration, agriculture, and energy production, and major pressures to increase. So who sits off in that little 10% box? Coca-Cola, Toyota, all the big manufacturing and industrial operations around the world that really fuel economic development and, and employ people. So we're quite keen, and you know, as one of my Indian colleagues reminded me, if you want to stay in that box, you better think outside of the box. So we do a lot of work in the hydration and hygiene space. We do a lot of work with sustainable agriculture, and we do a lot of work within the industrial sector and within our own operations. And so when you see the strategy, you'll start to see as we click across that, it's really responsive to a lot of these mega trends that are shaping the risk landscape. I think most of you are quite familiar with that. One thing I will tell you globally, the price of water to acquire it and treat it uh, is going gonna, is gonna to outpace global inflation. So we look at operating expenses, and um, we are expecting significant increase in the cost to use water. So we do a lot of analytics here. I'm, you know, I'm a trained professional, and I know how to scare people, and that's really what I'm trying to do here. Um, but, you know, we have spent a lot of money and a lot of time understanding how water resource uh, availability is going to change. The operative word here is change, right? Just like in any system, you're really looking for shock effects, not the long term, right? So places like Idaho Falls, they, get, they get 14 inches of rain a year. They've adapted to that. They're good to go. Atlanta gets 50 inches of rain. They've adapted that. They're good to go. Atlanta gets 30 inches of rain one year, and we're on the brink of collapse. We get one to three billion dollars economic impact, 20 to 30,000 jobs lost, right at the time when, right when we were coming out of that, the global recession kicks in. So we were in a weakened state, right, in advance of uh, the global recession. So econ water resource sustainability is a key component of economic resiliency. So, and you can see there's a lot of places around the world that are going to get much worse before they get better. Generally speaking, um, you know, we're going to see the largest increase in human water use be over the next two decades that we've really seen in the history of mankind. So it's a big deal. So here's our strategy kind of in a nutshell. Uh, everything starts with plant performance. You know, that's really water efficiency and our wastewater treatment. We want to make sure we're doing everything that we can to be good environmental performance ourselves. I like to talk about the iron triangle of sustainability, which is environmental performance, risk management and productivity. And I've found that if you really want to manufacture organizational leverage and drive sustainability strategy within a company, you really need to be hitting on all of those. And the more you lower your environmental footprint, the typically you're going to be reducing your risk and you're going to typically picking up a productivity gain that can be reinvested back in your business, to improve your margins and whatnot. So, but we do know that um, our business is only as sustainable as the communities where we're operating. Now, you, I say sustainable communities, you should probably hear secure and stable communities because they're really kind of synonymous terms. But our connection to that is water resources. And so under the concept of shared value, we really want to invest in sustainable watersheds around the world, promote that the sustainability of those watersheds, because A, it's important for that community where we're operating, but it also reduces our risk as a business to make sure that that water supply is available. So if you're enjoying our products, I would, enjoy, uh, would encourage you to sh pick it up, shake it around, and ask yourself how much of that you could make if you didn't have water. Right? So you understand why we're in the game. So, uh, but global awareness and partnerships, you know, we're really um, very fortunate. I mean, Coca-Cola is the most recognized brand in the world. I mean, everybody knows who we are. We have a convening power. We've got a chairman that's giving voice to this issue all over the world. He's very committed to it. And our partnerships, we've, we're delighted to have uh, three of our partners in the room today, the World Wildlife Fund, the Agency for International Development, and uh, the, the Nature Conservancy. And so we're able to leverage these partners, partnerships to make us smarter, to help us with implementation, to give us scale, to have a collective voice around these issues. Because I guess the point, I'm trying to go quick here, but the point that I would end on is that the, when you crosswalk the missions and the agendas of these conservation organizations, 
there's a nexus between that and, this, and the viability of our business. Ecological system function and biodiversity are critical to maintaining the ecological services that these ecosystems provide to mankind. It's not only the right thing for the environment, but if we don't have the critters in the stream, we don't have good banks on the streams, we don't have sustainable supplies, those things are not going to be filtering the water for us. They're not going to be storing that water for future use for us. And so we found that common ground and we can co-invest and co-activate around those things. So again, um, just trying to be very brief, give you a high level sort of view of the risks and the strategy. And, um, and with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy Larson, who's with t the Nature Conservancy slash Linotech. Oh, excuse me, I got one more slide, I apologize. Um, I'll be brief. Um, these are metrics. So we have um, around water efficiency, around wastewater treatment, that's straightforward. The one that most people are quite interested in is our replenishment goal. So we are, you know, overall we're going to return to nature amount and an amount of water equivalent to what we use in the production of our products and what's in our products itself. So it's kind of a mass balance on water for the plant. And we're doing community water pro partnership projects that generate a volumetric benefit equal to what our production volume is. So it's kind of a neutrality concept. We're in the early stages of that, but you can see the idea here is for sustainability and risk not to be, and I hope this resonates with you, it's not a, risk is not an evacuation motive, right? The risk is bad, we're out of there. We want to be a net positive contributor, and so this strategy is designed to, that it's going to be more valuable for the Coca-Cola plant to be in that community than for it to not be in that community. Fundamentally, in the essence, that's what we're trying to achieve. So, all right, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. Um, uh, who's going to talk to you about uh, some case studies and how we quantify the benefits of replenish projects. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I just, um, Joe just mentioned uh, Coca-Cola's water conservation goal, and I want to repeat it. Uh, it's to return to nature and communities a volume of water equal to Coca-Cola's product volume, and that uh, by 2020. And that is 130 billion liters per year. And the company is accomplishing this. It's currently 130. It's increasing. So it's a moving target. Um, and the company is accomplishing this through uh, uh, many different projects that uh, bring a wide variety of benefits, including social and economic benefits, um, uh, carbon benefits in many cases, improved biodiversity, and water benefits, benefits in terms of water quantity and water quality. And I'm going to focus on the water quality, the, the water quantity and quality benefits that are being calculated and tracked towards Coca-Cola's uh, replenish target of 100, currently 130 billion uh, liters per year. And the analytical work for this was done by the Nature Conservancy with Limnotech. The Nature Conservancy is a long-term partner of Coca-Cola. And the projects that fall, the replenish projects that fall into, uh, that generate water benefits are water for productive use, meaning water for agricultural purposes to improve uh, production, water access and sanitation projects, and water, watershed protection and restoration. Access to safe drinking water is a high priority for Coca-Cola. The projects that are in this category include household water pumps, community water systems such as boreholes, rainwater harvesting to provide water supply, and water treatment systems to um, improve the quality of the water. And the benefits from these projects can be metered uh, directly, or they can be calculated based on the number of beneficiaries. And you want me to move this up a little bit? Okay. I'll move this up a little bit. All right. Uh, based on the number of beneficiaries and the um, World Health Organization uh, minimum daily requirements. And as an example, the Re Replenish Africa Initiative, or RAIN, uh, this is the signature project of the Coca-Cola Africa Foundation, and uh, it, um, uh, USAID is a key partner through WADA, uh, through Water um, and uh, Development Agency, um, and the pro one of the priority goals is to provide access to safe drinking water to at least 2 million people and through at least 100 projects. Uh, and the projects, you can see the list there. Um, in addition to these types of projects, uh, there are watershed projects as well, but I'm focusing here on the water access projects. And Coca-Cola has put in $30 million over six years to this, and they understand that they, as a company, they can't solve all of Africa's water problems alone, so they, they're seeking to leverage funding to achieve at least a one-to-one -one co finance on this project. The benefits from rain are currently estimated at 1.5 billion liters per year. 
The watershed protection and restoration projects, these are really different in nature than the water access projects. They cover a, a wide range of activities, everything from agricultural improvements to improve the efficiency of water use. Agriculture is the largest user of water uh, globally and in the United States. To improve the practices in terms of fertilizer and, and pesticide use and improve uh, the water efficiency of the use. Uh, land cover improvements, these are projects such as reforestation and land preservation like in the Amazon rainforest. There's a very large uh, project that Coca-Cola is contributing toward um, that bring significant water benefits. Uh, surface and groundwater quantity management, these are things in streams such as op changing the way dams are operated, sometimes taking the dams out to improve the, the um, environmental flows in the river. Uh, projects such as floodplain reconnection, uh, where that has been lost because of alterations in a river. Uh, and in, in India, for example, rainwater harvesting and aquifer recharge projects are collecting rainwater during the monsoon season and then recharging the aquifer so that it's available during the, during the dry season. Water conservation and leak repairs, this is another important category where uh, aging infrastructure and there's a need to fix the leaks in systems uh, and wastewater treatment. And, and wastewater treatment can be, uh, we think of it as very large plants, but it can be something simple like in the picture on the bottom right, that's a WWF project in China and it's a constructed wetland to treat, uh, to treat a community um, wastewater flow. And the benefits that come from these projects are are generated in terms of water quantity and water quality. Um, as an example, uh, WWF project is part of, through the partnership, it's uh, through the, uh, the Rio Grande Rio Bravo Basin, which is one of the priority basins. This project is in Big Bend in Texas, and the goal of the project is to promote channel conditions that support an improved aquatic and riparian habitat for a variety of species. And basically what's happened in this area is Invasive species like uh, salt cedar have come in along the riparian zones and created and blocked off the floodplains so the channel is deep and narrow, whereas a healthy ecosystem is, is a wide, shallow channel that has a floodplain for spawning and provides food supply and habitat. And so uh, WWF is treating the river, moving down the bank and treating the river by taking out the salt cedar and destabilizing the bank line so that the floodplain can then uh, function as it used to. And we can quantify the benefits of a project like that. Those are measurable benefits in terms of water quantity by looking at the volume of flow uh, that's flowing into those floodplain surfaces that were dry before and um, are now reconnected to the river. And that's the benefit that we calculate. So in this case, the benefits have been calculated at 837 million liters per year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Neeby. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Neeby. I um, cannot operate this. There we go. Um, I manage our global partnership with the Coca-Cola Company. I'm based here in D.C. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about our global partnership, but also what I think are some trends that are happening in this general sector. Um, so this is really the philosophy that uh, our partnership with Coca-Cola is grounded on. It's this idea that water sustain, sustains us and conservation unites us. As Joe mentioned, the primary ingredient in all of Coca-Cola's products is water. Without water, they're out of business. From our point of view at WWF, if we don't have water, we don't have life. We certainly can't sustain biodiversity ecosystems, but we also run into real trouble with industry, with community stability, a whole host of issues. And so what excites me about this partnership is that we're really looking not at sort of a traditional philanthropic relationship where Coke gives us money to go out and do some really great conservation work in the field, but this is really about us both challenging each other to be better institutions and better organizations and to go deeply and meaningfully together into the freshwater issue. Um, so we, we've working obviously on the river basin conservation work, which is what Wendy touched on, but we're also looking at factors like supply chain, at climate change, about getting Coke to reduce their absolute greenhouse gas emissions, or greenhouse gas emissions, um, and then also looking at how that folds into the water conservation issue. Um, most people are very familiar with concepts of global warming and climate change, but where we're really going to feel those impacts are in freshwater, in freshwater quantity, reliability, supply, quality, 
Um, so it's really important that we think in an integrated and holistic fashion about how we're going to advance the environmental agenda. <clears throat> so this gets to one of the trends that I'm really seeing out there in the field, and that is collaboration. This is an example of us in Alabama, I believe, working on rain barrels. Um, the plastic container to the left is, or the right, depending on where you're standing, um, is an old syrup container. It used to contain Coca-Cola syrup, and we are working with the Coca-Cola company and their bottlers to refurbish and recycle those so that they can be used in communities where <coughs> water is a challenge. Um, but I think more, what tells me more about this is that it's about going out into the communities and really understanding what's that very local issue, what's the local water challenge, and then thinking how we can learn from a series of local activations and scale that up globally to have real meaningful global impact. And so this is just one example. We've got seven basins across the globe where we're partnering, and so we're really trying to understand how we can really bring Coca-Cola's marketing muscle their business acumen together with WWF scientific expertise and our knowledge of biodiversity to really get at the root of this and stop thinking from opposite sides. And then the other thing that I think is really important that I'm seeing is that we're be beginning to bring a lot more science to, the, to bear on this issue and really thinking meaningfully about what's happening with global water risk, global water scarcity, how we can think about where there are places of biodiversity that are really significant to us at WWF, and how we can really move those pieces together. Uh, the replenish commitment, what's exciting to me, is that it's a way of measuring and quantifying what we're doing together. Um, there's certainly a huge host of issues that we've got ahead of us, but by being able to measure our results in some meaningfully, meaningful way is really important to us. I think sometimes in conservation, we talk in qualitative terms, and that's great. We can point to some fish, we can look at a, a furry little panda, and that's great, but I think being able to really acknowledge uh, some movement um, in a measurable way is important. So just wanted to highlight a couple of trends. Again, it's, I really see collaboration and the inclusion of science and metrics uh, as being really sort of where we're headed in this whole space. I think now we're opening it up to questions. Does anyone have a question for Joe or Wendy or me? Don't be shy. Yes. Um, my question is, are you doing anything on the consumer side to educate consumers on the value of water and how to interact more sustainabl sustainably with water?
Hi, Joe. Uh, Jeff Hayward with the Rainforest Alliance. You mentioned that um, a lot of the water issues re um, usage is through agriculture, and a lot of Coca-Cola's products, uh, whether it's sh sugar or tea or, or fruits, are uh, agricultural products. I wonder if you could explain a little bit of what you're doing in terms of the sustainability and the production of the agricultural components of your products. Most people don't realize that Coca-Cola buys 4% of the world's sugar. We, uh, we have controlling buys, basically, in other ingredients. So we are a major player in the agricultural commodity purchasing space. And, and I would say we have um, major risk exposure in that regard. You know? I mean, we have, I like to call about, call, uh, we've got red spots, blue spots, and blind spots, right? <laughs> Seeing spots here. Uh, red spots are obviously scarcity issues. Blue spots are where you have water-related risks in water-abundant areas, and I'll tell you, water-abundant developed countries, we're seeing a lot of risks unfold for business in that environment. The blind spots are what you're getting at right there. So how do we understand uh, the water-related risks to our agricultural supply chain? So we are in the early stages right now of, um, well, maybe middle stages of developing a sustainable agriculture strategy. So the, one of the things that we know about the strategy as a guiding principle is that it's not going to be only about water. Right? That's the first thing. It's got to be about you know, water, about climate, about social, about labor. It's got to be an integrated strategy on sustainable agriculture, and we're working that out. We've got some pilot projects in different places to kind of prove out the strategy and, you know, and get some feedback loops on that. The other thing is, is um, we are working um, in uh, supplier engagement. You know, there's any side of risk always has the other side of the coin, which is the opportunity side. So we are engaged with a lot of our key suppliers, agricultural and other suppliers. And I like to say we engage them on the problem, and then we create solutions that reflect a shared vision that really have that balance of risk management, but what's the innovation opportunity as well? We don't want that conversation to only be about the risk and only be about environmental performance, but it has to achieve environmental performance. It has to achieve a risk reductive value. Uh, it has to you know, make our footprint better. You know, that's for sure. But at the same time, we don't want to lose the opportunity to, to derive value out of that. You know, and so how can, you know, so you can see here, for example, uh, these uh, water bottles with the green. You know, this is a plant-based, renewable uh, fraction. 30% of that bottle is made out of uh, renewable, uh, you know, from the agricultural space, you know. And so uh, that's a business development opportunity, and we have an opportunity to get in there and shape some of the practices in that regard. So that's a great question. Hopefully it was a good answer. Yeah. question and then we're, we're very good at here at the ICF making sure to uh, get out of here on time. So people can come up uh, after uh, we finish and uh, um, ask any other questions for us then. Just putting you back in the hot seat, it's Melanie Nakagawa, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Just wanted to talk a little bit more about your operations overseas and, you know, in countries like India with, you know, significant groundwater problems and other countries as well. How does a company interact with the local government from pr provincial level or the national level to ensure that there's sustainability when the country themselves may not be monitoring or measuring that stuff? How does a corporation, you know, help influence that dialogue or how do you engage to ensure that your practices aren't, you know, further contributing to, you know, problems in those countries, if, even if they may not be managing them themselves? Perfect question. I'm gonna, I should get an honorary PhD as I answer this. Um, okay, so that's a great question. I'll tell you, first of all, it's multidimensional strategy. That's the first thing. So let me, uh, let me start at the grassroots, and then I'll build up to the international policy engagement that we have in this regard. So first of all, we have deep, robust analytics beyond what you would ever imagine, and understanding the exact nature of water use around the world. Is it population? Is it agriculture? Is it domestic? At an extremely granular level. And we'll go into places, what is, if somebody knows a stat better than me, 60 to 80 percent of the GDP of India is agriculture. You know, it's like, you know, an 80 plus percent of national water use is agriculture. So you have to understand this. And so what we'll do at the local level, uh, the Agricultural Extension Service in India is known as the KVK, right? So we'll go into a place, we know we have a plant, it's got 92 percent of the water use in that area is agriculture, and it's half hectare, you know, 10,000 half hectare farmers, right? So 
just flag that and say to yourself, what happens if I improve agricultural productivity efficiency and unemploy 9,500 of them? You, you guys you know, are going to grapple with that problem. That's a labor issue, a security issue in its own right. But so we'll go in and we'll engage with KVK and say, we want to create an educational program. We're going to bring in drip irrigation technology because they're using flood irrigation right now. And we're going to require the farmer to go through training. Build that, we build the capability at KVK. They train the local farmers. We pay for and sponsor the, I the implementation of drip irrigation. We've got, in this one case I'm thinking of, it's in Caledera, India, in the state of Rajasthan, which is a desert. Um, and we're um, improving 40% uh, the water use in that. And their yields are going up. Their chemical inputs are going down. Their, their yield is getting better. Their margin is getting better. We know that if we scale that to about 1,000, we believe that market forces are going to take over and begin to, they're going to want to do it on their own as a competitive advantage, be more efficient with water and highly productive. So that's kind of at the local level. We do engage with, um, in, in this particular, just following this one example, this, you know, the city of Jaipur in Rajasthan, we're working with the local government to help alleviate some of the water supply issues for domestic purposes because that actually, you know, it mitigates a, a risk for our company. We use a tiny fraction of water, and if we disappeared, it wouldn't change the water situation. But we're visible, and we, we draw a certain amount of attention, so we're engaged in that regard. Then when you go all the way up to the international level, we're working with the World Economic Forum. Our, our chairman is very keen in that platform, and we're working with the Water Resource Group 2030 team. I'm personally on point for the India, and we have gotten um, the state of Karnataka in southern India, Bangalore would be the big city there, to engage in, a, they signed a memorandum of understanding to engage in a policy transformation project, and we've got a team on the ground right now working through policy transformation at the provincial level. There's a lot of, oh well, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty, this is probably the only audience I ever talked to that knows the issue better than I do, but there's amazing challenges with the way water resources and the governments are set up in countries all over the world. And water is really very much a state-level issue in India. There's no national policy to speak of that's effective. So, but we're very active in that. So we're hitting it on the physical side, putting the pressure exactly where the problem is. And we're in there with the political, local government side. And then we're at the policy level as well. So yeah, it's probably more than you realize Coke was doing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Wendy, Catherine, and Joe. And thank you, everybody, for coming. I know uh, it's a very busy and uh, interesting uh, day up on the hill today. Um, so uh, if you have any more questions, please, our presenters will be here a little, for a little bit time after, and I look forward to seeing you at our next uh, uh, staff educational uh, briefing. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.